the most overlooked aspect for developing a wider dynamic range and a richer diversity of tone color on the violin or viola it's the study of sounding points and learning to manipulate them and understand their relation to all the other variables in our plane that includes um, bow weight, bow speed, where in the bow we are playing, how much bow we use, how much hair we use, if the bow is tilted or not, what string we are playing on, whether we are in a low or a high position, so it changes the string length, and of course also what the articulation is. <sighs> That's a lot to think about. So we often realize the need to work on this arsenal, usually while learning a piece of music that begs for a certain sound or the need to really transform it in a certain way, or upon realizing that our sound is for some reason just never consistent enough and we can't quite figure out why, even though we understand basic concepts of, you know, bow speed and bow weight, and seemingly we're working hard, but there is still a problem. One of the best resources to dive even deeper into how sound production works and explore the possibilities of your instrument is in Simon Fisher's book called Tone. This book really focuses on how to maintain a pure tone, but while adjusting different variables like bow speed, bow weight, all while changing the sounding point. And he has so many examples, you can kind of use your repertoire as a guide um, as to which exercises to focus on and why. So Simon Fisher has a number system that defines five sounding points for reference. So there are sound points one through five, going number one over here by the bridge, number five over here, right by the fingerboard, almost sultasto. So you can think one, two, three, right in the middle, four, five. So in this video, um, I'm gonna sample three or maybe four of the many exercises in the book, which can get very challenging, but also very rewarding when you go play your repertoire afterwards. And as a bonus, I'll include one with double stops and some shifting toward the end of the video. If you're interested in getting this book, for which there is also a viola version, I will put my affiliate link down in the description below. If you use my link to make a purchase, I might get a tiny commission, but it's of no extra charge to you, and it's one of the ways you can help to support this channel. The first example focuses on smooth string crossing under a slur in different sounding points. And there is actually an introductory little exercise at the top of the page, which um, just kind of gets you familiar with the spacing um, between the strings and how much to move the bow to get a really smooth string crossing by playing uh, the double stop. You can actually try this in different sounding points and what, what you're going to notice right away is that when you play this closer to the bridge, the sensation of the string crossing is slightly different because the strings are ever so slightly further apart from each other since they are so close to the bridge, that's where the natural arc is. And as you get to the fingerboard, the strings are closer together, so we don't have to move the bow as much. So we're going to do um, the beginning of the exercise, and we'll do four notes to a bow, as it's written. Notice how there are numbers in circles on top. Those represent the sounding points from Simon Fisher's number system that I explained earlier. And notice how sounding point five which is near the fingerboard, it's piano, then naturally sound point four is, becomes mezzo piano, then mezzo forte, and forte as you get closer to the bridge. And one other thing you're going to notice, um, if you do this on all pairs of strings, because you see it's the same exercise on all three pairs, is that the same sounding points um, on the E string versus on the G string, 
they will sound a little different so you're gonna make you're gonna have to probably make some small adjustments in the bow weight as you do it and you're gonna kind of hear what you need to adjust it's very small but it also depends on you know how sensitive your strings are to one another and you know it's really hard to explain in words so it's something that you really need to experiment with and see for yourself and you know over time you'll make new discoveries so we'll do on G and D strings we have first check the double stop and using that to create a nice balanced bow arm we're going to play The sound is naturally getting fuller and I'm changing the bow weight just a little bit for each one. And finally, forte, a little closer to the bridge. So now we'll do the second line, coming back down, starting sounding point two. So for the next example, we're going to play separately on each sounding point and what we're going to play around is changing the bow length um, while playing quarter notes and he has for each string um, two versions of this exercise, one in first position and one in fifth position because um, when we play with a shorter length string, a lot of the sensations will change and actually we need to get closer to the bridge when we play with a shorter string. So you'll notice that, um, and I'll use the D string for this one. Uh, you can choose any one that you wish. So you'll notice that for first position, we start at sounding 0.5 and go all the way to two. And for fifth position, since we, need, we have a shorter string, we'll start at sounding 0.4, getting down all the way to sound point one. So we are sound point five, the whole line is right by the fingerboard, starting with little bow, and then for each measure we use a little bit more bow and more bow until we reach a full bow, and then afterward we get back to smaller bows. And as you do this, we also need to slightly adjust our bow weight to maintain a pure sound as much as we can. So starting in the beginning, and start right in the middle, sounding point five, check the bow and feel comfortable, check your bow hold and check how your arm is feeling, that your shoulder is not raised. We'll start with small bows and here we go. So the dynamic changes very slightly. We do want to stay within the piano range. So it almost creates different shades of piano just by changing how much bow we're using. So now let's try, uh, let's not go through all of these. You know, this video can take forever. So let's skip to sounding point two. Same string. It's a little bit more difficult on the D string because naturally D and G string don't like when the bow is too close to the bridge unless we move the bow very slowly so for this one for sounding point two on the d string will be very very challenging to use the whole bow and maintain a pure tone so we could consider a slower tempo because of that
can imagine um, what happens in sounding point four and three based on these two that uh, we just went through. Now, just quickly uh, to do one in fifth position, we'll start with the note B, sounding point four. So this will be actually similar to what we did in sounding point five in the beginning, but we have to move the bow a little closer because the string is shorter and we'll do the same thing as the first time. So one observation I made right away, right now, as I was playing, in, right away I noticed how sensitive the string is playing in fifth position like that, in that sounding point and also in that kind of dynamic. So it almost felt like I really, really needed to get the bow to float even more. So this is one of those really exposed parts that is a little more challenging to play super clean. So this is a great exercise right here, D-string fifth position, you can give it a try. Okay, so this next one is super challenging. I find it really, really hard. I'll do my best to show it. And it's about playing adjacent strings, going back and forth with changing sounding point and dynamics. So do hairpins. Um, and at the same time, Simon Fisher gives a specific direction when to use less bow and when to use more bow. And at first glance, it's not what you expect. At the top of the crescendo, it says to use less bow. Again, it goes less bow on sounding point five. Then we move the bow closer and we use more bow. And then at sounding point one, even, it says, which is actually at the top of the crescendo, it says less bow. And that is because when we're so close to the bridge, um, if you use more bow, if you use even a little bit too much bow, you're going to get ponticello. So the idea is to try to get that pure tone to remain while creating these dynamics. So I will do G and D string, that very first exercise. Oh, by the way, um, there are also rhythmic ver variations on a lot of these exercises on the very top. And I'm just keeping it simple and just doing the quarter notes here. So when you add those variations, you can also explore what happens then. So let's see, we are starting on A and F. And one thing you can do is actually this one is good to follow that first one we did with the string crossing because this one crosses strings as well. So you can find that um, balance between the two strings. And after each note, we're going to try to move the bow closer. Find that double stops to make easy string crossings. try for comparison, uh, let's try one of the rhythms. So uh, I will take, let's say, the second one, the second rhythm. my best sound. Um, I could use a lot more work on this to see what else I can do differently. Sometimes with these exercises, if you do them right and be really present, you're going to start testing the limits of your instrument um, based on your current skills. You're going to expand on what you already know and find new ways of doing things. So for example, in this exercise uh, with the rhythms, it doesn't specify where in the bow to play them, right? So right now I just picked something random um, when I was just playing. Now if I play in a different part of the bow, this rhythm, if I do it near the tip, I might discover 
a completely different feeling. I have to do something totally different and it's going to sound different. So there are so many possibilities. Actually, there is an infinite amount of sound that is possible if you think about it. And this is something that I think the greatest players, that's what they really mastered, is they really mastered on exploring the sound and really falling in love with what's possible and at the same time, of course, um, expressing their own musical voice. Now, as I promised at the beginning of the video, I will throw in another exercise with some double stops and shifting. So let's get into that. We're going to also do hairpins in this one and I'll do this with thirds. Um, I made a video about thirds recently, so you can go check it out. What we're going to do here um, as we shift upward we'll do same finger shifts here as we shift upward our bow is going to move toward the bridge so both our hands will be doing the same thing so sometimes actually doing this is kind of natural because our hands do like to copy each other but still there's something about moving the bow closer with the shift Something about that is tricky here because we have to do it during the shift and not during the note. So it really depends on how fast you play the actual shift. So if I did a slow shift, then the bow's moving slower. But if I did it quicker, closer to the second beat, You notice that I had to move the bow so quickly that you kind of heard a little um, break in the sound. It wasn't very smooth. So you can try this with different uh, speeds of the shift, which is not specified here. Again, this is one that you can try on your own different ways. So for this one, um, one thing I can do better here is when I get here to the bridge, I should slow down the bow a little bit because if I start with a fast bow and get really close to the bridge, I need to be careful that it doesn't become ponticello, especially because I'm on the lower strings here. Yeah, really trying to get that sounding point one there. It has to be a really slow bow, okay? So that's the idea, and you can and it keeps going. Um, you notice that on the second line here, it even specifies don't go to sounding point five anymore to start with. Go to sounding point four, and that is because we start using the middle range of the fingerboard again. The string length gets smaller here, so being too close to the fingerboard when we're in a higher position the string tension is very light it can't quite handle it the same way so it, the sound can easily crack if we're not careful it's possible so if let's say i go to a higher position just from playing a random note right here right over the fingerboard on 7.5 it's very, very sensitive. So just for a little bit more control, I'll move to sounding point four instead. And right away, it's already smoother. So um, just gonna skip around here and do another one. Uh, let's do one with six. And let's do E string. A and E string, we haven't done that here in this video. So let's say this six. And you can try the same thing up bow. Crescendo is pretty easy on an up bow. I like to do this down bow to practice my down bow crescendos. and so on. Okay, so these were just a few examples. There are also 
uh, double stops with short bow strokes, uh, some that just isolate really high positions, like scales in the high positions up on the E string. Um, we see that in the repertoire quite a bit. String crossing in spiccato with all of these ideas and it goes on and on. And there is just, this is a gold mine, I think. At first it may seem boring to do these kind of exercises because there's no actual music backing them up, at least, you know, in the book itself. But learning to be really present and really pay close attention to the relationship between the bow, the string, and the sound that's coming back at you, it can lead to new ideas and discoveries along the way. Since this book includes so many different scenarios, you know, like um, legato, double stops, spiccato, martelli, um, uh, different bow strokes and different parts of the bow, uh, different positions, we can use sections from our repertoire and then use them to figure out which exercises in the book would be a most beneficial study to help us play that section of music better. And overall, it will help us just to become a little more familiar with what we can do and take our playing to the next level. That's it for this video, folks. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or a colleague. If you would like a summary of all my content in both video and written form, I do have a bi-monthly newsletter that goes out twice a month. It is completely free and even comes with a PDF practice template. Let me know your biggest takeaway in the comment section below and happy practicing.